why did I take the 580? I'm gonna be late again. God, I'm so tired of being late. Maybe I should get off. Of course, no one's gonna let me get over, are you? No, of course not. Always acquiescing to everyone. I should just cut in. Just I do that all the time. I do it about everything. And then I end up late. Ugh, you look like the walking dead. You look so pale. This can't be how I'm supposed to look. I just, why am I always so tired? I'm always so tired. I should go somewhere. I should take a vacation. Oh my god, it's him. Please don't see me, I look awful. Please don't look over here. What am I doing? It doesn't matter if he sees me. I am not in his league, that's for sure. Why don't I have to carry all my weight in my stomach? I look like Buddha, and I'm this enlightened. I need to stop drinking red wine and eating cheese. It's cancer. I just know it. It's in my family, my dad, uncle. I eat like a pig. He gets to know how scared I am. It's like I'm all by myself. I don't know where to go. This is what he today. Just water. What if David brought donuts again? All right, I'm not eating a donut. I'm not eating a donut. I'm not. I love donuts. I feel wonderful this morning. I love living in the city. And Scott, mm -hmm. I'm so excited to spend this weekend with him. Look at you. Happy people are so annoying. Hello? Hey, Scott, I was just thinking about you. Hey, you dropped this. I'm willing to change. I'm willing to release my old patterns and negative beliefs. The power that created me has given me the power to create my new life. I choose positive, fulfilling new thoughts. Begin anew, right here, right now. All of us are on a journey, whether we know it or not. We are all on a journey of learning to express our full potential in this world. Most of us have learned to view our thoughts as a reflection of the outside world a reflection of what is happening to us. But what if that's not how the universe works? What if, with every thought you think, you are actually creating your present and your future? What if you are creating the story of your life with the very thought you are thinking now? Then perhaps, if we are willing to change the way we think, wondrous new possibilities would begin to reveal themselves to us and our lives would move in a whole new direction. It all starts with taking the first step. Every thought we think and every word we speak is creating our future. It's as though our thoughts go out into the universe and are accepted and brought back to us as experience. You become what you think about, uh, wh whether you want it or not. The thought that you are thinking is vibrational in nature and therefore attractive in nature. So. When you care enough to take the time to change it from what you are terming negative to positive, you have shifted your point of attraction. Nothing is more important than understanding that. And if you just...
did that one simple thing, you know, of spotting the limitations and the limitations in your thinking and trading those in for a positive new thought in that area, it'll eventually lead you to all the other stuff. It'll lead you through. And how would our lives be different if we, if we could cut through all of the static and simply choose in our lives what we would like each moment of each day or our relationships or our abundance or our careers or the peace in our families to look like what would our lives look like if we could do that we're so busy on the cell phone we're text messaging somebody we're on the computer we're on the internet we're watching soap operas once again we're looking outside of us people don't realize their greatest potential because they think it's from an outside source when it's so divinely ordained within them now it's how do you turn that around it starts with thinking differently. You can be fully supported by the universe by following your dreams and your passions and your inner guidance. Your willingness to contemplate yourself as a person who is capable of attracting into your life what you want, having the kind of relationships that you want, being able to have abundance where you know scarcity always exists. All you have to do is begin the process by being willing to contemplate the presence of that in your life. I started to be introduced to uh, looking at the world in a different way. For example, through Louise's book, You Can Hear Your Life, which was very influential to me early on, when I thought, wow, there's something about the way I think that may be influencing what's happening in my life. We now know that we can rewire our patterns in our brain with cognitive behavior therapy or affirmations. It changes the way our brains are wired, and they light up differently. So it's not just this fluff, woo-woo stuff with purple, but it really has biochemical, neurochemical, neuropharmacological effects just as effective, if not more effective, than Prozac, Zoloft, you know, whatever else you have. So Louise Hay, former model, former therapist, discovers something by observation that science supports decades later. There's not one person here that cannot improve the quality of their life. I constantly do it. What I really ask for is how can I increase my understanding? Because the more I understand about how life works and how thought works, the better my life gets. I have just entered my 80th decade, and wonderful, wonderful things are unfolding before me. It's extraordinary. And I have made a decision that this decade is going to be the best decade of my life. My life, as far as I know, was very good until I was 18 months old. And then everything hit the fan. And my parents got divorced and I was put out into a foster home. And then later I came back with my mother and then I was about five years old when she remarried. And she remarried what turned out to be a brutalizer. Uh, we didn't know that at the time. So the next 10 years of my life were very, very challenging. There was a lot of physical abuse and, uh, and sexual abuse. I grew up in a family where really you were taught that you were no good, you were worthless, nobody loved you, and nobody would love you. And when you have that belief, then life gives you those experiences. I was raped by a neighbor at one point and the man got 16 years for it. Uh, there was another neighbor that was after me. This was all when I was very little. And then uh, about the time I became a teenager, my stepfather stopped beating me and started to uh, have sex with me. And that was much harder for me to take. So I left home at 15. I knew nothing. I had no social skills whatsoever, uh, but I was out of the house. I was starved for love, and anybody who'd be nice to me, I went to bed with. And so within a year, I had a baby. And I couldn't take care of the baby, I couldn't take care of me. But I found the child a really good home. A couple who wanted a baby very much and couldn't have one. And so I lived with them for the last two months, and I had it in their name at the hospital, and after five days, I left. 
And what I did was I went back to my home, I got my mother, and I said, you do not have to take this any longer. You're getting out of here. And we both left. And we were together for almost a year. And then I said to myself, you know, she's okay, she's fine now, she's in good shape, and I took off. And I went to Chicago for three weeks and stayed five years, and then I went to New York for three weeks and I stayed 30 years and bumbled through life doing the best I could with the understanding and knowledge that I had, which was really nothing. I started out working in dime stores and things like that. And then when I hit New York, life sort of changed for me. And um, I became a model, a showroom model. And I'd had no education, so it was a very good job for me because I couldn't be a secretary or anything like that. And I did that for many years. I married an um, upper-class Englishman, which was a very nice experience. And I stopped modeling at that time. And we had 18 rather wonderful years together. And I was learned a lot about life. And it was like my social training because I had no social skills at all. And by the time we were partying, I had learned a lot. But when the divorce came, it made me feel very much like so many women feel that I was a total failure and I couldn't do it right and everything was wrong again. And uh, it was about five years later that I discovered this group called the Church of Religious Science, which uh, was where I heard, if you change your thinking, you can change your life. And that is where my life really began to change. We'll have all these speakers. We're all going to say the same thing, really. But we're going to do it in slightly different ways. And we want to, everybody wants to hear things differently. Just because I say something, some of you will get it, some of you will say, what is that woman talking about? But so another teacher, or three, or six, or twelve, can say the same thing that I say in different words. And you go, oh, that's brilliant. Never heard that before. I was living like a lot of people do, fairly unconsciously, but not aware of my unconsciousness, you know, just kind of going through life and often feeling as though life was happening to me, that I was a victim to what was going on in my life. I was really like living in a comfortably numb place, you know, there wasn't a depth of meaning in my life and I knew something was missing but I couldn't name it. We had a tax business. I, as a, as a young girl, started apprenticing with my dad when I was 16. He had a business in our home and we moved it out to a building. And in my early 20s, our business burnt to the ground. One morning, I got a phone call at 6 a.m. My mother called to say that the building was on fire. And when I got there, there were fire trucks and police and news reporters and everything that meant anything to me was in that office. And I had a nice front office with a glass front that I could look into and now everything was burning. When I was 12, I was brought to Boston to essentially have my spine completely fused. And I remember looking up saying, I'm gonna be a doctor and a scientist someday. And so I became pre-med at a very early age. And so after working as pre-med, I started falling asleep a lot, up to 17 hours a day. They gave me a medicine and the medicine started knocking out my bone marrow and there wasn't another medicine that would help. And so I was forced to look for other things. I went to a bookstore in Boston and I look up at the shelf and there's this book called You Can Hear Your Life by Louise Hay. And, you know, there were these things called affirmations um, that if you did, and you're supposed to get, you can heal your life, was the whole point. I did reps, just like you do in a gym. Instead of lifting barbells or whatever you, I lifted, I love myself just the way I am, 10 times. And after three months, I stopped falling asleep, and I was able to go to medical school, which was absolutely lovely. I myself had terrible migraine headaches once a month, twice a month, whatever. I'd been worked up in a Boston hospital a week there with all kinds of testing. They never knew what it was. At the age of 19, I had to do this English paper. And like most migrainous personalities, I needed to know what it was they wanted of me. And I couldn't figure it out. When I came out of the library, not knowing how to get an A in the course, I temporarily thought, 
Maybe I should just throw myself in front of a car. It would be easier than this. I lived in, a, in an orphanage un, until I was 10, uh, in a series of foster homes. The circumstances at that time um, were such that my father had walked out on his family, and um, I was born uh, in the Depression. My mother was working as a candy girl uh, in Detroit, on the east side of Detroit, earning $17 a week. And I can remember a girl named Martha came, and they were dropping her off for basically the same reasons that we were dropped off there. And they said, go find Wayne. And I came and I started talking to Martha. And she was crying and she was all upset and she was sad. And I, I was trying to convince her that she didn't have to be sad. And I remember saying to her, this is a great place. There's no parents here. You, know, you can do pretty much uh, anything that you want. I mean, you've got a lot of freedom and we're going to have a great time. And all you have to do is change the way you think. And it goes from being a miserable experience or a tough experience or a hard experience to, uh, to one that you can do anything that you want with. In that moment, when I watched the building burn, I wasn't thinking about, you know, all of the work that was piled up on my desk. I was thinking about my father standing next to me. I was thinking, thank you, God, that there was no one in the building. And I was also a little too upset about some of the physical items that I was losing in my office. I had more of a relationship with my adding machine than some of the people in my life because of how busy I was. The interesting thing was, this is where the soul is so wonderfully wise and resilient. I remember watching this fire and just being devastated by it on one hand, but there was this little voice that said, this is happening for a reason. You don't know why right now, and it looks horrible, but there's actually something wonderful that's gonna come from this, stay awake. So I was gonna throw away this intuition, throw away this affirmation stuff, because it was something that I needed to get to be kind of normal. I got to my sophomore year and I started um, really hitting the wall. I was doing an MD and a PhD. So I started blowing discs and stuff and I couldn't end up going in the intellectual career that I wanted to, being a neurosurgeon, because you can't stand up. So I chose psychiatry because I could sit down and I hated it. It was boring. But I learned it's very interesting. All roads lead back to spirituality and intuition. I go back to my dorm, I call my parents, and I say, I hate it here. This isn't working for me. And my father says, Quit. So quit. You can come home. And I changed my mind. And in that moment, I changed the migraine headaches. I maybe had three or four the rest of my whole life because I changed this pattern. And my perception was, you must do this. And you, I've you know, really been driven my whole life to get it right. And get it right, though, in the way that the culture, and, and in my case, the practice of medicine says is right. But here's the problem. Most of what I was taught in medicine about what causes disease is not the truth. I cured my migraine headaches, not with Imitrex, not with Advil. I cured them with a change of perception. Some people think the change has to be shocking, like diving into a cold pool. But it can be as simple and easy as letting go of the limiting beliefs you're holding on to. I can't change. I'm never going to feel healthy. I can't to have the life I want. I can't want. stop feeling tired. I can't, I can't stop be happy. wanting things that I don't want. change. I can't. You can begin your journey wherever you are, whenever you want. You may be starting your journey from a mansion or a homeless shelter. Wherever you begin, the gateways to wisdom and knowledge are always open. And the first step can be as simple as changing a thought from I can't to I can. I can do it. so much more control over your life than you thought you did, or control over your experience of your life, if not the events of your life. There is this sense that is so playful and so joyous, 
and it begins with changing the way you think. Life as you know it can change in an instant. Everything you call God can disappear before your eyes. And you know, it's not until you have a crisis like that that you're suddenly, you come face to face with what it is that really matters in the world. So it's a wonderful thing when you bump up against something that feels uncomfortable, because it's this opportunity to now feel the discomfort of it and work it into a place of greater comfort. That's how you get rid of those obstacles. That's how you let yourself flow in the way that you want. Okay, I can do this. I can do it. I can change. I can make my life better. I'm scared, but I want to change. I do. I'm gonna stick with this and I'm gonna try and... No, no, I am going to think more positive thoughts. Like, um, I am happy. I am happy. Oh, this is not going to be easy. The universe is not responding to your words, but your words are reflective of how you feel. And how you feel is reflective of the vibration that you're offering. And the vibration that you're offering does equal your point of attraction. So paying attention to what you say is a very powerful tool for understanding what your point of attraction is. It was on a, uh, on a tour of Australia and it was one of the first conversations we ever had. And so I was trying to rush her around and no one should rush Louise around. She used right time, right space, all in its good time type of person. And I said, Louise, let's do this and let's kill two birds with one stone. And Louise looked at me horrified and said, why would you want to kill two birds? She always walks a talk and everyone around her seems to pick up on that. From that moment on, I, I really was careful in what I said. You know, I, I stopped saying, I can't stand this, I, uh, th that person's a pain in the neck, or, or I'm hopeless. If you can really accept the fact that every time you think a thought and every time you speak a word, you are literally painting your future or whatever you want to call it, you are creating and you're creating your own life. One of the gifts of affirmations, the using of affirmations over the years, it's, it's allowed me to experience living in a state of abundance, living in a state of belief that all that I need will come to me when I need it, living in a state of recognition that all that really does matter is love. And it's because of using affirmations over the years, I find that I'm now more concerned with life as an energetic force, living in an energetic state of those affirmations instead of the actual words. To begin with, you start by what we call doing affirmations, and that is making positive statements about your life, and you do them deliberately. You might do them in the morning, you might do them at noon, you might do them at night, and as you start to do them, things will begin to change, maybe on a very small level. I call it getting the green lights in the parking places. The affirmations get you into that space where you are to recognize the healer that you need, recognize the teacher that you need, recognize the philosophy that will work best for you. Doing an affirmation is either writing it down, writing it on the wall or the mirror, or just saying it. My body now restores itself to its natural state of good health. I'm strong, fit, and vibrant all the time, every day. I'm in the flow of my work and play. My partner for life has arrived today, and wealth is here to stay. My income is constantly increasing. I'm infinite. I'm immortal. I'm universal. I'm infinite. I'm immortal. I'm universal. I do the work I love. I work with and for people I really like, and I'm earning good money. Now, you don't have to have a specific job, but under that banner, a lot of good could come into your life. I am passionate about life. I love myself. I, I am well, 
And then I, I bet you I said it three or four hundred times a day to get over the fear of having cancer. And I believe that not only saying it, but actually believing it. The affirmations is just the starting point. That's like going, okay, here's where the goal is. What really gives those affirmations power is the emotion we put behind it. So what's interesting is you start out the journey going, okay, let me start here. Step one is what's the affirmation. Step two is, you know, how can I generate the emotional power behind that affirmation? And a lot of that comes from taking actions to support that affirmation. That's how you begin to step into that state. And then as you step into that state and you take actions and you put the emotional power behind those affirmations, they begin to manifest themselves in your life. It's got to get anchored into your, not only your mind, but in your spirit. And you have to believe it. And when you're first doing it, it does, it feels, it feels fake. It feels silly. But after a while, you start to realize, yeah, you know, that's right. That's, yeah. What I like people to do is to stand in front of a mirror and do their affirmations. Because there's something very powerful about looking in your own eyes and accepting yourself or noticing that you reject yourself when you're saying something positive about yourself. Driving to work, when I first read Louise, I used to, she said, you know, that you should 20,000 times a day or every time you have a negative thought, just I love and approve of myself. You know, just replace it with that. For the longest time, I, I love and, I love and, I, I couldn't think of the other word. It was like, why can't I remember such a simple word? It is like planting a seed in the ground. It's not necessarily true at the moment, but it is something you want to have be true. So you put the seed in and you expect it to grow. You don't wait for two days and then dig in the earth and say, what's happening, what's happening? You expect that thing to grow because you know there's a law and a process. And the seed will grow if it is in the right soil and it has the right amount of moisture. And many people are finding out about how literal this language is in very interesting ways. I hear people say that they, they want a perfect relationship or they want abundance in their lives. And they say it with an air as if they have just put that manifestation out there and they're going to get it pretty quickly. And then I see them a year later and it still hasn't happened. And a couple years later, it still hasn't happened. The field is literal. The divine matrix is literal. So when you say, I want this to happen in my life, the field says, okay, and I'll let you want and want and want because there's no outcome. It's an open-ended proposition. It is like a computer. If you have this gorgeous computer put in front of you and you don't know what to do with it, it's a piece of junk. But if you learn the language of the computer, miracles happen. When I, I left corporations uh, early 1990s, I uh, found myself in the high, high deserts of northern New Mexico where, where I live today. Um, a beautiful part of the world. And during that time, it was one of the worst droughts in recorded history uh, in the American desert southwest. And a native friend called me one day and he said, Greg, would you like to join me uh, at a place, and I love this language, he said, a place where the skin between the worlds is really thin to pray rain. And he didn't have to ask me twice. I said, you bet. So we we met at an agreed location and we hiked 135,000 acres of the most beautiful high desert sage. We came to a, a stone circle that had been there for so long, he didn't even know who had placed the stones there before him. And I wasn't prepared for what I saw because my friend David took his old work shoes off. He put his naked feet inside of this circle and he closed his eyes. And the first thing he did was he honored all of his ancestors. He literally said the words. He said, all of my ancestors, all of my ancestors are with me now or with me now. About 20 seconds later, he looked at me and I'm, he said, I said, I'm hungry. You want to go get a bite to eat? And I said, well, well, sure. But I said, I thought you were going to pray for rain. And he looked at me and he said, no. He said, if I prayed for rain, rain could never happen. Because the moment we pray for something to occur, we've just implied, we've acknowledged it's not there now. And we may be empowering the very condition that we'd like to change. And I said, if you didn't just pray for rain in those 20 seconds, what did you do? And he said, when I closed my eyes, I felt the feeling of what it feels like to stand with my feet naked in the mud in our Pueblo village. And the mud's there because there's been so much rain. And he said, I smelled the smells of 
what it smells like when the rain falls off the earthen walls of our Pueblo village. And I felt the feeling of what it feels like to run through, through the fields of corn and the corn is there and it's so high because there's been so much rain. He said, I gave thanks of gratitude and appreciation for the rain that's already happened. When you speak an affirmation, even though at first when you speak the affirmation you may not believe it, in time, as you speak it, you come into the allowing of it. And of course, there are many people speaking affirmations who are not receiving what they are speaking because they're using words and wanting the words to make it so. But the universe does not respond to your words. The universe responds to your vibration and your emotions indicate what your vibration is. Affirmations are magnified if we use them in our dream state because at that moment the ego is asleep the logical mind is resting and therefore you have a perfect opportunity to program your future you program your mind with these positive affirmations our dreams are there to resolve conflicts between the conscious and the unconscious, and they're there to regulate our moods. But what if you went to sleep believing that you are all is well, you are safe, everything will appear at the right time when it's supposed to. I was a high school dropout, had never studied anything. Suddenly became fascinated with this idea that if I could change my thinking, I could change my life. And I started to study and I, I couldn't stop. I did a, lots of classes, lots of books, all sorts of things so I could begin to understand how this works. And at the end of three years, I was eligible to become what they called in the church a licensed practitioner, which gave me the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with other people. And that's, I think, when the changes really started to happen because I was sort of began to teach other people how to do this and how to change their thinking so they could change their life. People were getting good results working with me. And then I started teaching classes. And those turned out very well. And the next thing I knew, I was doing weekend workshops for 350 people. So one of the things I began to really notice was what people said, how they said it, and what was wrong in their body. And I started to put things together. And I really trained my mind to listen to what people said. I put a list together for my own use with clients. Of, and I alphabetized it so if you came in with a problem, I could look it up quickly and see what I had written about it. And I showed it to a friend in class. And she said to me, oh, Louise, what a great idea. Why don't you make a little book out of it? And I went, oh, really, a book. So my first little book was done in 1976 that was Heal Your Body. And that was the mental patterns for the physical ailments in the bodies and how to make changes. I really believe that the big boys, as I call them, would not publish the book. And if they did, they probably would want to change it because my ideas at that time were very radical. Your thinking can change your life. And I wanted to say it the way I wanted to say it. I didn't want a word change because I knew what I was doing. So I printed the book myself. So I went to the church printer because I didn't know where else to go. And I had this little 12 page pamphlet put together. And I remember taking it to my teacher and showing it to him. And he said, oh, Louise, isn't that sweet? What a nice thing you've done. How many did you have printed, 200? And I said, no, 5,000. <laughs> You're crazy. You'll never sell that thing. <laughs> but two years later, I had. I'd sold all 5,000. 
I sent a, a free copy to every metaphysical church that I could, knew of and an order form. And many of them took it. And uh, that was my first little book. I read her little book and I said, this would never work for me. But uh, I came home determined to try it. Um, at the time I was being treated for fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. I was self-employed. My energy was, levels were so low, I was barely putting in 20 hours a week, um, completely ignoring my children and my responsibilities. And I started her affirmation. My body now restores itself to its natural state of good health. And I saw the difference in a week. I said it all the time, and I started doing her mirror work. I would go to the mirror, and though I didn't feel it, and the words stuck in my throat, I would look in the mirror, and I would say, I love you very much, Jackie. You're perfect exactly the way you are. All right. This is going well. I have all the power. Nothing can stop me. I'm feeling healthy and, and breathing, and air feels really good, and... I'm accepting that I'm a part of the universe and giving me exactly what I asked for. Okay, so I totally tripped. It's all right. It was a positive trip. In the moments of deepest despair, there's actually humor always. Humor lifts us up to God. It lightens up every situation. But just before you get there, there's usually this time of pain-filled joy or joy-filled pain where you might have to break down with some deep sobs. When someone's in trouble, I think of them just like someone who's come out of a movie, a scary movie, and they're crying. Their tears are real, their fear is real, but what they saw that caused the fear is not real, it's a movie. So what I'll do is I offer some suggestions about ways to reframe their situation or find a blessing in a seeming problem. And yes, there are challenges in life that we all go through, and there's no shame with that, but it's what you do with the challenges that counts. Now that I know when so-called negative things happen, that they're really positive things, and that what I need to do is focus on a positive outcome, and then stay course, and then so shall I have that experience. The way that you retrain yourself is to shift from uh, having a fear to uh, having a curiosity. You know, substitute the word curiosity for the word fear. Because a lot of us, when we start doing those things to honor our soul or to express our creativity, those are really vulnerable acts. You know, the things that we intend or that we affirm for our lives are those things that are deeply important to our soul. And so they're vulnerable. And too often we turn to people who just squash them, you know, or who tell you why it isn't going to work or why that's a crazy affirmation or that's a crazy intention. That's called going to the hardware store for milk. You want to go to the people who are really going to hold your hand on the journey and say, hey, I'm there, right there with you. Awareness is the first step in healing or changing. When you're facing challenges on the journey, it's tempting to turn back or to blame somebody for the situation. The healing attitude, though, is to think of any external challenge as simply a reflection of your own internal resistance to change. I'm sure everyone I know thinks I'm totally nuts. Am I right? I'll never make it through this. I'll probably flake out like I always do. Besides, this isn't even doing any good anyway. Before the 15th and 16th centuries, um, all of the ships were made out of wood. Not because iron wasn't available, and steel wasn't available, but because there was a belief that wood floated. So therefore you had to make ships out of things that floated. And then someone came along and said that it has absolutely nothing to do with what things are made out of. It has to do with the amount of water that is being dispersed. That's, that's what determines whether something will float or not. And I think about that all the time because it's, it's in the contemplation of what you desire that you create what it is that you want to have for yourself. The law of flotation was not discovered by the contemplation of the sinking of things. I mean, come on. I'm not one of these self-help people. I don't believe in crystals and white light and the divine feminine and angels and source energy. I mean, what is that? Let's be real. This is all just 
wishful thinking. We tend to live our lives based on what we believe about ourselves, our world, our capabilities, and our limits. Where do those beliefs come from? More often than not, they come from what other people have told us. History, science, religion, culture, family. What if they're wrong? I love if people tell me what to do, and I please. If it weren't for my mom, I'd at least have a chance. I mean, come on, where was Louise Hay when I was growing up? I had no one to show me the way to be. And my dad is no Wayne Dyer, I can tell you that much. Anything you complain about repetitively is something that you have an unconscious intention to produce. And now, I'm just too old to change my life. That's it. Too old, lazy, short-wasted. I should have tried to be positive years ago. I think it really starts with realizing that you don't love yourself, that most people don't. Most people feel they're not good enough, that they haven't done it right, they won't do it right, they'll never be enough, and they're definitely not lovable. And when we come from that space, it's very hard to create things for ourselves that are really good. Things weren't so bad before. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. I'm fine the way I am. Everything's fine the way it was. And now I'm here. I've just stayed the same. Everything's messed up and confused. Well, at least I know what to expect here. It may not be the best, but at least I know how to handle this. And what's in the future might be worse. So I better not try and go out there and change things. What if I fail? What if I don't succeed? I should just go back. I don't have time for this. I mean, I have so much to do. I'll, just, I'll come back later. I'll do it later. A job, all these important things. And I gotta go. I just, I have to go. A lot of times, we're missing information about what the next step might be in terms of the action equation of affirmations plus actions equals miracles, right? A lot of times we're missing information about what to do, how to take action, but we call it something else, like, I must be afraid, that, that's why I'm stuck. What if I lose my friends and family doing this stuff? People are gonna think I'm crazy. People are gonna find out that I'm involved in some weird psychological thing and they're all gonna laugh. I just wanna go home. Right, it doesn't feel right. We have been conditioned to feel the feelings of the things that we don't want in life and that we're afraid of. We wake up in the morning and we see the six o'clock news and then we go through our day saying, oh, I hope I'm not going to see that today or I hope it's not around the corner. Where do we learn to feel the things that we don't want rather than things that we choose to have? If you can just remember that he was, he was completely different when uh, I heard his voice come back on the line. And so, you know, that kind of thing lets me know that it's possible to, um, to live your life that way, that it's possible to live your life kind of on the contribution side and let it be okay to receive back also. What's wrong with me? What am I not doing right? I'm doing the inner work. Where's the reward? I keep thinking positive things. I keep being specific. And I'm not moving forward. Fine. Maybe I won't move forward at all. I'll just sit here. And not move at all. How do you like that? Who am I talking to anyway? I was diagnosed with cancer and it was vaginal cancer and when you look back at my childhood uh, with the rapes and all the other childhood abuse and you realize that one of the mental causes for cancer is de resentment, deep resentment that is held very strong till it literally eats away in the body. So where would I put my cancer? So. I remember being very terrified, like anybody would, and I called my teacher and I said, Eric, they say I have cancer. And the first thing he said to me is, who is they? And I said, the doctors. And he said, 
Louise, you could not have done all this work on yourself to die of cancer. Now let's take a positive approach. And I clung to that. It was a lifeline for me. And I did things I hadn't done before. I went from being a junk food person to uh, doing nutritional work and, and detoxifying my body. And I was detoxifying my mind. And I did a lot of things. Uh, I had tools to work with. And I said to myself, you're being given an opportunity to practice what you're teaching. You're telling people that they can heal anything if they're willing to do the work, and now it's your turn. I remember working with a therapist and banging pillows and, and you know, getting anger out and all that stuff. But I think that the work I did at the time that was the most important for me was to do forgiveness. And I began to investigate the childhoods of my parents. And when I found, discovered their stories, I could understand where they were coming from. There were, you know, there was just horrendous things on both sides, all sides. So how could they know how to treat a little child when they didn't, weren't treated that well themselves? So as I began to do the forgiveness work and the therapy and the, the nutrition and everything, within six months, I was able to get the medical establishment to agree with what I already knew inside, that I no longer had cancer. And when that happened, I knew that anything could be healed. I knew because I had done it myself. And all the other stuff helped. But I knew that what all the affirmations and all the stuff I was doing. So that gave me an extraordinarily strong belief. And when you have a strong belief, you can do anything. I was diagnosed with a condition inside of my body where a doctor told me that something was growing, a cancerous tumor that shouldn't be there. And I had gone, I trusted the medical system because that's our culture, that's the way we're raised. And there's a part of us that says, even if I go the holistic route, I'm going to let a medical person tell me what's going on just for that validation. So it was my opportunity to put into practice everything that I ever learned. And rather than concentrating on something that should not be in my body, I began feeling uh, that my body was, was vital and healthy rather than focusing on making something change. However, uh, through the influence of family and friends, I underwent a medical procedure anyway. I went into the operating room, I was anesthetized, and the next thing I remember I woke up and there was a doctor looking at me and he said, what are you doing here? There's nothing there. All I'd done were the practices and the principles that I'd traveled halfway around the world to learn and I employed it in my own life and it worked in that moment. I have the photographs showing there's nothing in my body. I was anesthetized uh, and they, they did an exploratory for no reason at all. Because of that, I can speak with conviction. I can look anyone, a scientist, uh, a doubting audience member, and I can look them in the eye with conviction and say, this is what I know to be true in my life, that there's a power inside of your body. The ancients say it's the most powerful force in the universe. The philosopher Neville, uh, early in the 20th century, said that there's a power inside of every human against which no earthly force is of the slightest consequence. I did a whole bunch of research on, uh, on cancer. I wanted to know who had beaten cancer and what, what was the common denominator. So I, had, I, I did a lot of reading and I discovered that the common denominator was everyone, no matter what treatment that they chose, they were well because they changed the way they thought. I knew that opening myself up physically to the surgeon's knife was an adjunct to true healing and that I needed really to open spiritually. Your body's not your enemy, which of course I think anyone who's first experienced a disease or pain, I think we're taught that, you know, why is my body doing this to me instead of why is my why am I going through this experience? And it sort of let me shift my thinking to, you know, I need to love my body through this. I'm thankful that I, I actually got cancer because I needed a big wake up call. Um, I needed, I was the type of person that needed almost to, you know, to get hit between the eyes. <laughs> I'm in remission and I feel wonderful and I've never felt better about myself. I still walk around daily and I use that affirmation that she had for cancer. It's the, um, 
I lovingly forgive and release everything in my past. I choose to fill my world with joy. I love and accept myself. It was life-changing. It was one of these things where not only was I grateful for my illness, but in the end, much healthier than I had been before. Given that the heart is a huge electromagnet that in fact trains the rest of the body. It's not a thinking process. Thoughts are important. The ancients made the distinction between thoughts and feelings and emotions. And it's the feelings that are, are centered in our heart that there is an effect from that, that it changes the electrical and the magnetic fields in our heart and that those fields literally change the stuff that our world is made of uh, around our bodies. And what the science now is showing is that when you can change the field that the atom is in, you change the atom. And we're made of those atoms. So when we have feelings in our hearts, we're changing the field uh, that connects the stuff everything is made of. And we literally are altering our physical reality in ways that sound miraculous. So this thought or the state of deep relaxation or whatever it is that enlightens you actually results in a decrease in stress hormones, a normalization of blood sugar, decreasing of um, blood pressure, and a relaxation of all smooth muscles. It is, in fact, a balance of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic is the brake, and sympathetic is the gas. And most people in this culture have the gas on all the time with an occasional break. So you're going around like this. When both are in balance, you can work so much more efficiently and so much longer because you've got this beautiful yin-yang balance. The Sanskrit traditions have a seven energy center or seven chakra system that they work with. And they say the upper three are related to what we call thought or logic processes. So when we think about something, we picture it in our mind, that perfect relationship or peace between nations. But we can only invite it into our lives when we breathe the power of emotion into that thought. The emotion comes from the lower three of those creative centers in our bodies. So when we breathe the power of emotion into our thought, we imbue that thought with life. And those two energies meet in the one center that is not accounted for yet in our model, it's in our heart. You look at these books by Beck, all these fathers of cognitive behavioral therapy, you open them up and the rewiring patterns that they give for obsessive compulsive personality disorder, or, you know, selfishness of the narcissistic personality, or all these, or even just normal people who are a little messed up, was I love myself just the way I am. So in my PhD, and in my psychiatric residency, and I'm now a neuropsychiatrist and I work in the field of intuition, I learned the biochemistry of how someone rewires their thought patterns from I get one health problem after another to I love myself just the way I am. I am completely lovable. So I will be forever indebted to Louise Hay, what she did to me personally, because she woke me up, and literally what she has done as a revolutionary for, from my perspective, modern medicine. I seem to have been a born teacher, and. I gathered a lot of people to me. I was doing workshops and classes. And when the second book came out, it was slow to start with. And then the whole AIDS crisis struck. And for some reason, life said, you are going to be in it. I didn't know anything about AIDS. Nobody knew anything about AIDS. But I remember one day somebody called me up and said, Louise, could you start a group for people with AIDS? And I said, well, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I said, all right, well, let's meet. So we got together one night. There were six men in my living room. We sat down and I said, I don't know what we're going to do because nobody knows anything about this disease, but we're going to do what I've always done. We're going to work on dissolving resentment. We're going to work on forgiveness. We're going to work on loving ourselves. And we are not going to play Ain't It Awful. We are not going to sit here and talk about how awful it is. I said, we're going to take a positive approach, and anybody who learns anything positive about this disease, we're going to come and share it. If you have anything that's working for you, we're going to share it. And I talked about my ideas, 
And then we sang a song and, and did a little meditation at the end, and they went home. And the next day, one of the men called me and said, Louise, it's the first time I've slept in three weeks. The next week, we had 25 people. And it started to grow and to grow and grow. And it, what it was, it was a safe place for people who were terrified out of their wits to come and not be told they were bad, not be told there was something wrong with them, but to take a positive approach. Within six months, there were over 90 people in my living room and hanging out of the doors and windows because there was no place to go. And then we got a gymnasium in West Hollywood and the next week it was 150 people. And then the next thing you know, we outgrew the gymnasium and finally the city of Hollywood gave us a meeting home. Uh, we were having 850 people every week. People used to call each other up every week, going to the hayride tonight. So <laughs> we became known as the hayride. I wanted to put this uh, the hayride on tape or make a movie of it or a video so that it could go to other groups and other groups could see what we were doing. I'd like you to continue to hold hands. Those of you who are new and don't know our song, you'll learn it by next time. <laughs> so I, I discovered then it would cost $40,000 to make a video at that time. And I thought, oh my God, we don't have, you know, two. But I kept knowing that we were going to make this video. It would be a good video. It would go out and would go to all these groups. Those were my affirmations, and I just kept saying them. And then uh, somebody came up to me, and he was a director, and he wanted to direct this thing. And I said, wonderful. And then the offshoot of that was that he said, all right, let me have, give me your foundation number. And I said, I don't have a, a foundation and he said oh okay i'll have my accountant set one up for you and out of all that i got a foundation which i have till today and it's what i call give away money whatever money comes into that foundation is given away but anyway we made this wonderful video called doors opening about the group that we had at the time this is the first time i've been to your group okay welcome uh six weeks ago I found out that uh, I had uh, a malignant tumor in my lymph system. Mm -hmm. Four weeks ago, I found out that it had spread substantially. And two days ago, I found out I had AIDS. Um, I need to hear a lot of what all of you are saying, and there's a lot of people in this room that are friends of mine. I've been just real petrified to bring this out and to talk about it. I've been having real symptoms. I have doctors and T-cell panels to back it up and even bone marrow biopsies to back it up and all this stuff. And I've been trying to figure out what am I dying of? Today, I just want to, I want to find out what I'm living for and not what I'm dying of. When you talk, Tom, you talk for a lot of people. You're not the only person. And you know, the thing is that if you're looking for a savior, and I know a lot of people here are looking for a savior. The place to look is right here in the mirror. Right here, honey. This is the savior that you're looking for. What do you want to say to him? You know, one of the things that I would love to do in this world, if I could, was to see that everybody was fed and clothed and housed and loved and had a fulfilling work and fulfilling creativity. I think that would be wonderful, but it's not that easy to do the whole world. However, if I can do one individual at a time, when you have made your changes, you will automatically change people around you because of the person that you are. You will teach by example. I don't heal anybody. That's not what I do. I just provide a space where we can uncover how absolutely wonderful we are. And many people find that they are able to heal themselves. And this is very heartwarming to all of us. I was on the Phil Donahue show and the Oprah show. And they both came out in the same week. And on that week, the 
Hay House went bananas. I mean, the phones were ringing unbelievably, and I wound up, my book, You Can Heal Your Life, wound up on the bestseller list for 13 weeks. And it's never been the same since. Life just exploded this out. And uh, the rest is history. Louise is the pioneer. She's the leader, she's the forerunner of what? Of the fact that consciousness creates reality. Consciousness is real. Consciousness is not some airy-fairy baloney thing. Consciousness is, consciousness obeys the laws of physics. She said, bless and prosper everyone around you. Bless and prosper yourself. And that's so deep because, you know, when you love yourself, you love others and and what that is about is the fact that everything in the outside world is within us and our molecules of emotion they're not just within ourselves running our own body but they're a vibration joining all of us greatest accomplishment of my life was my ability to forgive my own father who walked out on, uh, on our whole family when, when we were just on a, on a woman with three children under the age of four. I very often meditate and pray to him and thank him for, for coming into the world and teaching me the most important lesson I had to learn on this planet, which was how to forgive. Mark Twain had a wonderful quote. He said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. And I have an image of that. What I call organic forgiveness is a very great useful thing. And that is when a person organically has an experience of forgiveness after claiming responsibility for all of their feelings. So when I finally get in touch with, oh, I feel hurt, but that's inside me. It's not like you're doing it to me. That breeds organic forgiveness. When a person can claim responsibility for things inside themselves, that is a sign that they're in touch with their own vibrational nature. They're in touch with the forces of creation. A very good thing to do when you are feeling less than happy is to look at it, or whoever it is, or whatever it is, and take a notebook and write the person's name or the situation and say, what is it that I'm thinking about you that I'm using as my excuse to not allow myself to be who I really am? When you say, what are you doing that's making me unhappy, you're giving them all of the power because they have to do something different to make you happy. It's a very conditional love you're living, a very conditional happiness. Once you identify that and then think the thought that who you really are would think, now happiness is easy. Coming into alignment is easy. It's just a matter of caring about how you feel and practicing feeling good. Whenever you have a conflict of any kind in any relationship, whenever you have a conflict, that the person who is willing to be of Tao, of God, of sort, is the one who will um, practice forgiveness or will go, go to the person that they have a conflict with and, and bring love to it. 
person who lives the life of a higher consciousness is the person who says, I end all conflicts on love. I forgive and I set myself free. 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 I forgive and I set days when I worked with people, I used to uh, fix this problem and fix that problem and you'd have this uh, health thing and we'd work on that and we'd work on this. And one day I discovered, much to my amazement, that if I would help people learn to love themselves, to really accept themselves as they are, we didn't have to work around problems because it was almost like a miracle. Everything seemed to fall away. All the stuff that was in the way and all the stuff that wasn't working. I've got this book by Louise Hay. I start reading the book, and her whole emphasis was not on dealing with the disease so much, but dealing with yourself, and dealing with, you know, do you love yourself? And I, you know, went through all the, the little exercises that she had. I'm doing the daily affirmations, and what I realized that at 43 years old, I had never learned how to love myself. I remember lots of times I would ask people, well, what is really wrong with you? What have you done that is so terrible that you're not acceptable to yourself? And I never, ever, ever got an answer that made any sense. You know, they might say something like, well, I'm too fat. Well, so? <laughs> you know? I was very self-critical. You know, I think women go through this whole thing where, you know, it doesn't matter how other people tell you you look. It matters how you feel you look when you look in the mirror. And I used to... You know, look at myself in the mirror and I would see my flaws. I would see the things about myself that I wanted to change. When you talk about loving yourself, a lot of people think that that's vanity. But it isn't really. It has nothing to do with that. If you look in the mirror, just simple things like looking in the mirror in your own eyes and saying, I love you. I really, really love you. And it helps if you use your name, Louise, I love you, I really love you. It gets to that little child inside that has been rejected for so long. And it breaks open sort of a, a dam or a, a door or whatever you want to call it. And it's like little miracles start to happen. Lots of little good things happen. You know, all the work that I did with what she taught me Within three months, the cancer was gone. I am clear now, and I feel fabulous. You can recognize that you are a being that has self-worth. Then you start to treat yourself differently, and I think that's what's so very important about loving yourself, is you stop beating yourself up, you stop making yourself wrong, you stop talking about how awful you are, and you start to treat yourself with a certain amount of respect. And this makes an enormous difference because what you give out in life is what comes back to you. The fastest journey to loving oneself is to look for things to appreciate everywhere you look. Because if you can find something to appreciate in that flower, you're not in that moment a vibrational discord to loving yourself. If you can find appreciation in that child's face or in the beauty of a friend, as you find things to appreciate, the vibration of appreciation and the vibration of love are identical vibrations. I love and accept myself. Deep in the center of me flows an infinite wellspring of love. Love fills my whole being and radiates out from me in all directions, returning to me multiplied. Give and receive more love every day, and the supply is endless. I love myself, therefore I take loving care of my body. I love myself, therefore I provide for myself a comfortable home. I love myself. Therefore, I work at a job that I truly enjoy doing. I love myself. 
therefore I behave and think. All my relationships are harmonious. I'm deeply fulfilled by all that I do. Every experience is a success. I deserve the best, and I accept it now. I listen with love to my body's messages. I am healthy, whole, and complete. I express gratitude for all the good in my life. Each day brings wonderful new surprises. Everything that everyone wants, whether it is a material object, a state of being, a relationship, a pile of money, a circumstance, an event, every single thing, without exception, that you have ever wanted or ever will want is because you think you will feel better in the having of it. So if you will let your primary intention be to feel good, you will work all of the wrinkles out of this evolving journey that you are upon. This is how it's worked for me. Every time I've visualized or affirmed, I get this inner roadmap given to me in the form of gut feelings that are repetitive that urge me to take action or visions. I was married to a man who decided to control me by telling me how awful I was. And I believed him for a long time and my self-esteem just plummeted. I didn't think that I could do anything in the world except for be a wonderful mother to my two sons, which I think is an important purpose. But there was something more. I would pray all the time, tell me my life purpose. I kept getting these visions to go give speeches, and I didn't know how to do it. Because what could I, this person who didn't have any confidence, possibly teach anyone? What I later learned is that we don't have to worry about how to put our visions or our dreams into reality. All we have to do is follow the guidance that we get one step at a time. It's very common for us to overwhelm ourselves, to frighten ourselves by thinking about the end result. It's so big. Here I am as somebody who wants to write a book. Oh my God, how am I going to write a bestseller? There are things you need to learn between A and Z that you can't complete Z until you learn them. Overcoming self-doubt, for example, is one of those things. And so that's why you take step B, because maybe you just have a little bit of self-doubt about going to the bookstore to buy that book on writing a book proposal. It's not enough just to ask. It's not enough just to have positive thoughts. You've got to follow the guidance you get as a result. Sometimes people tell me that they feel like their prayers are being ignored. Because the universe gives us little baby steps, one step at a time, it's often unrecognized when you're told to go read a book, take a class, call someone, write a letter. But if we do step A, then we're given the next set of instructions, step B. Then we're given the next set of instructions, step C, and it takes us step by step to where we're going. As your desire is moving and you are moving in the direction of it, you feel the ease of that. It's only when you turn in opposition that you feel the resistance of all of that. I began in in my bedroom, literally, in Santa Monica, with my 90-year-old, uh, almost blind and almost deaf mother, who lived with me at that time. She would uh, help me uh, mail the books and things like that. It was a very, very small operation. We were just doing what we could. And we're now in 35 different languages and 30 countries. You know, it's very interesting to me that ever since I put my foot on the spiritual pathway, it is as though I've had nothing to do with my life. Life has taken over and said, you will do this, you will go here, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. I just do what's in front of me. From the very beginning, we answered the telephone, we opened the mail and did what was in front of us. And things kept growing and growing and growing. My vision was, how can I help the people? How can I help
is my life. This is really my life. To me, I think enlightenment is letting go of all the things we believe that are not benefiting us in life or the barriers to our life, to the good things in life, and to release them one by one and just think, I don't have to believe that anymore, or do I want to believe that anymore? And making a conscious choice. It feels like what surrender feels like when you've been so attached to an outcome and you finally let go. And you feel this deep sense of relief in knowing that, you know what, the cards are going to fall the way they're going to fall, and I have the ability to handle whatever happens. It feels like awe. There's, there's just this powerful knowing that you're not alone. So we can give it a lot of different names, but the key is that, that we are, I believe, much greater than we've been led to believe in the past. And I think that that's where the healing really begins, us understanding uh, and accepting that power in our lives. You cannot fake your point of attraction, can you? It is what it is. And everything in the universe is reflecting it back to you. I have great gifts. I have an incredible life. But I've had a few problems. I have a little bit of a back problem. I, I fall asleep in a weird way. But I have been given incredible opportunities. It all began with reaching up for that book. With Elise, hey, you can hear me. I follow my inner ding, what I call my inner ding, yes. Well, it's that feeling, your instinct. It's an instinct thing, and it either feels right or it doesn't. I follow my inner ding. Excuse me. I don't know which path goes down to the beach. Yeah, you have to turn around and go... thoughts create your life it's that simple and when we can get that we can make enormous changes <laughs> 